Um, yes, at Westborough, we've been thinking about issues in uh, mental health, and I thought it would be good for us to share um, part of that uh, message, at least, with, uh, with us here at Emmanuel Church uh, Normandy. Uh, last week, I quoted from the foreword to a booklet accompanying a course that Suzanne and Terry Butler um, attended on adult mental health awareness recently. And the foreword to the booklet uh, on adult mental health awareness says this, it says, we all have mental health. And just like our physical health, it needs looking after. Um, I don't know, I don't know whether you are whether you would count yourself as someone who um, very carefully looks after yourself, or whether you might be a bit like me. Um, I'm interested in the things I enjoy. I'm not that interested in looking after myself. But anyway, it goes on to say, one in four of us will experience a mental health issue in any given year. It says the economic cost of mental ill health is estimated at between 74 and 99 billion pounds a year. The human cost is incalcul incalculable. And I said last week that suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 45 in the UK. And that's a staggering thought. But the booklet goes on, learning more about mental health and ways to get support can empower people to thrive. And I said last week, I'd like to change that last sentence to say, learning more about mental health and ways to get support can empower people to survive. Anyway, last week we began thinking about our reaction to the mental health suffering of others. But maybe one of the most important things for us to know when we are considering our own mental health and how we deal with it is knowing that we aren't alone if we are struggling and also recognizing seriously that mental health distress isn't something Christians can't suffer. Uh, we heard uh, last week Isaiah 50 verse 10 in the Good News version, a verse that helped me no end as a younger Christian. Isaiah 50 verse 10 in the Good News version, all of you that honour the Lord and obey the words of his servant, the path you walk may be dark indeed, but trust in the Lord, rely on your God. All of you that honour the Lord and obey the words of his servant, the path you walk may be dark indeed. If it seems to us at the moment that the path that we are walking or the road we happen to find ourselves at this moment going down seems dark, well, it may not be because we aren't honouring the Lord anymore. It may not be because we have turned off his way. It may not be because it's as a result of our disobedience or our disobeying his word. All of you that honour the Lord, all of you that honour the Lord and obey the words of his servant, the path you walk may be dark indeed, but trust in the Lord, rely on your God. Anyway, today I thought it would be good for us to hear from someone, a Christian leader who has long believed in the Lord, but has also long suffered with depression. Uh, you wouldn't expect to find a clown who cannot laugh. And is there anything sadder than the tears of a clown? Well, we might think perhaps something that is sadder is, is a Christian church leader who is suffering from chronic depression. But anyway, I thought it would be good for us to, to, to watch a video, a testimony recorded this summer by a dear friend of our family, uh, the Reverend Martin Kurt. He's vicar of the Church of the Holy Spirit in Aylesbury. Uh, Suzanne and I uh, first met Martin and Anna, his wife, in, in um, 
before we moved to Guildford in our previous uh, pastorate. Uh, Martin was uh, appointed vicar of St Andrew's Parish Church in Malcham when I was serving Malcham United Church and we, we, uh, we grew to know Martin and Anna very well. Uh, we're godparents to one of their children and uh, for those of you that know our family, uh, Martin's wife Anna is the golden retriever breeder responsible for our dog. Uh, so we do know Martin and Anna very well. Uh, but in June of this year, Martin um, had been preaching to his church folk in Aylesbury on the topic of mental health. And in the last of, of the series, Martin spoke about the healing of Naaman the Syrian, which we read about in 2 Kings 5. Uh, and Martin, in the first minutes of his uh, sermon, was talking about the way that Naaman can be an example to us of uh, of non-Christians becoming Christians and having to submit to the, to the word of the Lord to them, having to, having to do what he says, even though it might seem to them uh, to be foolish. But then, after talking a little bit about, about that, Martin began sharing his own testimony. Because it seemed to him some years back that the Lord was speaking to him about his need for healing. Not physical healing, but mental healing. Um, anyway, uh, we, uh, we're going to join Martin's sermon about um, 10 minutes in, when I can find it, there it is. Um, you, will, you will see that Martin has um, a bit of a, a funny picture above him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sometimes the crown appears before his head. Uh, but I would encourage you to listen. And as Martin speaks, he talks about seven things that he believed the Lord was telling him he had to do. Thus, this story can describe the process by which someone becomes a Christian, transfers from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. However, I do believe that this story can also speak to believers certainly spoke to me over the years, particularly during a time in my life when I was very desperate for God's healing power to come upon me. For about 25 years of my life, roughly between the ages of 15 and 40, I experienced depression in varying degrees. Outwardly, for much of the time, I might have seemed okay to some. Inwardly, I was often in torment. I grew up uh, in an environment really where depression wasn't greatly understood, certainly not as well understood as it is today. And there's stigma, there was stigma uh, attached to it, uh, less stigma today uh, than there was then, I think. And the unfortunate thing was that I just really didn't understand what I was going through, what depression was all about. I considered it to be essentially a character defect Christians, I thought, weren't supposed to get depressed because we should be counting our blessings, we should be um, uh, full of the joy of the Lord, uh, and uh, we should have a, a positive, joyful outlook on life and not be depressed. But you see, the problem is that if um, someone is depressed, imagine that you're depressed and you hear an inner voice saying to you, well, you shouldn't really be depressed if you're a Christian, so pull yourself together. Uh, What's, what's going to be the result? Yes, you've guessed it. You're going to get more depressed because you've just given yourself another major reason to feel rubbish about yourself and how you're failing. And of course, that's what I did. It actually got worse when I became ordained. When I was a curate, there were some days when I could hardly work more than a, an hour or two before collapsing exhaustedly bed and I believed it, it, somehow this was my fault uh, in my mind over and over I played these negative thoughts I thought about the turmoil the damaged relationships missed opportunities in my life happiness foregone agonized regret over various things uh, I had seen a doctor in my early 20s uh, when I was working to train as a solicitor I was working in London uh, and uh, I had uh, two mental breakdowns uh, at that time and uh, I saw a doctor who helped me for a while with some medication but I thought 
that I'd got beyond that. But here again, uh, a few years later, ordained and thinking that uh, I should be sorted by now, uh, I was in the pits of depression once again. And I, so I, I dragged myself round to a large doctor's practice near where I lived. And I saw a young female doctor of Asian appearance whose clothing suggested to me that she was probably a Muslim. So you can imagine, here I am in uh, this doctor's surgery, confessing to a young Muslim woman doctor that I'm in a pit of depression. What a great witness, I thought, for a Christian leader. And she told me, basically, that she didn't really think she could help me medically, that I should address lifestyle issues. And for me, that just felt like a new low, because years of self-hate, two mental breakdowns, two broken engagements, an abortive career as a lawyer, academic failure at theological college, were all crowned, really, by this young doctor, confirming my worst fear that my depression was something I really ought to be able to sort out myself. I was just a loser, a pathetic excuse for a human being, a mouse, not a man. But then things seemed to turn around for a while. Uh, uh, I was blessed with uh, a holiday. And I, I finished my, my curacy and I had a three-week holiday in South America. After that, I joined the Christian community in North Devon at Lee Abbey where I met uh, Anna, lovely Anna, who became my wife. And we moved to a small town in Wiltshire after leaving the community where we had our older two boys, Ben and Harry. But although my life was actually so much better in, in many ways, the depression the, and the anger, which I've uh, since learned is a, a root cause or one of the root causes of depression, had not really been healed. It, began to come to the surface after a, uh, a while of, uh, and threatened everything, really, my, my, my marriage, uh, my relationship with my children, my ministry. And so, uh, again, I was at rock bottom. And like Naaman, though, I, I, I was blessed by hearing uh, the kind and truthful word of the Lord through someone about my depression and anger. I heard a Christian doctor with a teaching ministry uh, about depression, speak about how we are whole persons, body, soul, and spirit. And treatment for depression, he taught, often requires actions on all of those fronts. Several things need to be addressed often when it comes to depression. There can be various spiritual, psychological, and physical causes, perhaps all of those combined. I felt the Lord telling me through the story of Naaman that there were seven things that I needed to do, none of which I would like. Just as uh, Naaman had to humble himself and do something he didn't want to do seven times, I had to surrender to God in seven ways to find healing in Christ. So the first thing I had to do, I felt God saying, was to recognise that this issue was not just something internal to my own world. It was deeply affecting others, uh, most of all my wife, uh, my children, my wider family, my work colleagues, parishioners, uh, and friends, and uh, lots of others. I realized that as a Christian, I actually had a duty to seek wholeness and healing. I couldn't just pretend that my inner well-being was, was just a private concern for me. And you see, there are some Christians who have areas of their lives that are not as they should be. Perhaps a health issue, perhaps some kind of addiction or compulsion, perhaps some kind of distortion in their sexuality. And they think that it doesn't really impact on anyone else. But the thing is, it does, and it will. Naaman's skin disease, for example, would certainly have negatively impacted his wife. And had he, out of stubborn pride, refused to do what Elisha commanded. He might have returned at home with a sense of dignity intact, but he'd have still been thoroughly diseased with all the consequences for those around him. Second thing I had to do, I felt God saying, was to overcome my fear and pride and be willing to go and seek medical help again. And uh, I went to my local practice 
Uh, and again, I was faced with a young female doctor. This one was a, a Christian, though, and uh, I admitted my depression and my anger and the destructive effect that this was all having on my family life. I admitted to her the rages I was getting into and the terrible things that I would say and do in the home. And mercifully, she, she didn't judge me, but gave me the medical help that was part of the healing. Sometimes I, I look at the little sertraline tablet that I take every day and I'm tempted to think how ridiculous it is that this, this pill should be necessary in maintaining my mental equilibrium. But I think that is, is pride talking. We're body, soul and spirit combined. Diabetics can't say, well, how daft that I should need shots of insulin to live a normal life. I'll just try harder to be okay. They would soon be reminded that no matter how hard they try, in the absence of a dramatic healing miracle, they do need their insulin. In a fallen world, our bodies are weak like our souls are, and we need to face that fact. I mean, if out of arrogance, because I didn't want to admit to any physical weakness, I decided to leave my spectacles at home and I go out driving, I'd be a fool, I, I'd be a danger to myself and, and others. Uh, I need the glasses because I'm short-sighted, uh, and so the only way I can drive safely is by wearing them. So just as uh, diabetics have to take insulin and short-sighted people need to wait, wear glasses when they drive, I had to swallow my pride and swallow the pill as well. The confession I made at the doctors was part of my healing too, uh, generally, Protestants aren't very good at confession. Uh, Roman Catholics uh, are sometimes much better at that because of the, the tradition they have of confessing their sins to a priest. It's true that we can, I believe, pray directly uh, to God, but sometimes we don't really truly acknowledge the reality of our sin until we speak it out in the presence of someone else. James 5 verse 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The third thing I had to do was to be willing to go for counselling. Now for some Christians, counselling is regarded as something that is really just for the loopy. There's a real pride barrier in seeking psychological help and that could be a real obstacle to healing. To think that our minds function perfectly well all the time, thank you uh, very much, is actually the, the height of, of vanity. Sometimes we need to find help from someone, identifying the negative uh, thought patterns uh, and the subconscious false assumptions that we maybe have grown up with. I wonder how many Christians have, have struggled on repeating the same mistakes, living the same half-life, handicapped by mental obstacles which could be identified and removed with the help of someone with God-given wisdom. So those three things, being willing to admit the full extent of the problem and its impact on others, being willing to seek medical help, being willing to seek counselling, those three things were like Naaman having to bathe the first three times in the River Jordan. He didn't want to do it, uh, and each time Naaman did it in front of all his servants and attendants and military escort, it would have been embarrassing, perhaps even humiliating, but it was the only way. It was the only way for me. My next three dips in the River Jordan, so to speak, were all lifestyle and dietary. I had to give up caffeine, which for people um, who don't have a problem with depression, uh, caffeine in, in moderation is fine. Uh, some people have a bit too much and they get rather wired. Um, but for people with uh, depression, uh, caffeine is uh, has been described to me by the uh, uh, doctor uh, who had this teaching ministry about depression as, as liquid evil, uh, because caffeine chemically interferes with uh, my ability to regulate my, my mood. Uh, which is um, under par anyway, and uh, so caffeine makes it worse. And so I had to give up caffeine. Now, again, I hate the fact that whenever anyone says more tea, Vicar, I have to say uh, only if it's decaffeinated, and they have to rummage around in their cupboard to see if they've got any decaf tea or coffee. 
And it's just a reminder each time of my weakness. And then, secondly, there was uh, alcohol. That was the second dietary change. Um, and this one was even harder than the caffeine. Not that I was a particular drinker, but, um, uh, you know, there, there, were, there were times when I just loved to be able to have a, uh, a chilled glass of uh, a glass of chilled white wine in, in the summer or, or a, a nice uh, red wine by the fire in, in the winter. Uh, and uh, non-alcoholic beer is quite good these days, so I've got used to drinking that. Um, so that's not so bad, but, uh, but missing out on wine, that's, uh, that was a bath in the River Jordan I didn't want, uh, let's put it like that. Alcohol is a, a depressant though, and I knew that for my healing it had to go. Again, it's humbling having to decline and perhaps to explain the reason why. Sometimes I've been tempted to say no to alcohol and to say rather piously that I'm too total for the Lord uh, and to receive the approval of some people for my moral rectitude. <laughs> but the truth is it's because of my weakness. Uh, and a bit like a recovering alcoholic who would be afford to take a drink, uh, it would be uh, wrong of me to drink alcohol um, because of the effect it has on my ability to uh, uh, think uh, healthy uh, thoughts, to balance negative ones. And then the third one of my lifestyle changes was um, having to watch my sleep. Sometimes um, I want to stay up late working or watching TV or something, but unless I get an average of eight hours across the week, uh, eight hours a night, I do begin a downward path. Um, so there's a discipline there which I don't always like having to pursue. Now, as Christians, we are called to look after our bodies, which are temples, we're told, of the Holy Spirit. We can't ignore the effect of our lifestyle and our actions on our bodies and think that we can remain spiritually untouched. So that's six dips in the River Jordan, one more to go. The last the seventh uh, remedy that God prescribed for me was prayer ministry and deliverance ministry. Now, some people think that ministry of deliverance is spooky and dramatic, uh, but mostly I think that's a misunderstanding. Uh, really, if uh, you go to experienced um, prayer ministers who know about delivering people from unclean spirits, then um, the ministry certainly that I've, I've had with LL Ministries uh, has been uh, you know, quite um, gentle and, and uh, almost low-key in some ways. Um, the theological basis of it is that um, it may be that um, a spirit may have been passed down through the generations. Uh, there are spirits of pride, of uh, violence, lust, addiction, uh, various other things, um, and these perhaps need to be confessed and, and renounced. Uh, there are also ways in which the Bible says we can give the devil a foothold in our lives uh, by getting involved in some kind of sin, and sometimes that mean that can mean that we uh, make ourselves open to an unclean spirit. Uh, it may be the words of someone else, maybe words of someone close to us that we've. Uh, uh, taken in ourselves, perhaps a mocking spirit, or we've believed something about ourselves that someone has spoken over us like a curse. Uh, most deliverance is about cutting the ground from under the feet of the enemy by identifying spirits, by confessing sin, uh, and inviting Jesus to be Lord over our whole lives. So actually thinking of our um, lives maybe like a, the different rooms uh, in a house, in a home. Uh, it may be that we've allowed Jesus into uh, the, uh, the dining room, but we haven't allowed him into the kitchen or the living room or the bedroom. Um, it, it's just about um, making sure that the whole of our lives are given over to the Lord Jesus. Um, and if sins are confessed, if forgiveness has been extended to those who've hurt us, if we've identified and renounced curses, and unclean spirits down through the generations, then uh, any spirit um, can just be commanded to leave without any histrionics. 
uh, and normally it will be that way. There's understanding of the issues, true repentance. Spirits mostly leave quietly. From my, from my own experience, like I say, I can recommend you know, Ella Ministries for this kind of uh, ministry, which is done in a loving uh, and firm and gentle atmosphere with sound biblical teaching. Some Christians deny the existence of the supernatural or, or the existence of demonic spirits. Now, others think that this kind of spiritual um, deliverance is only really relevant to people who've been steeped in the occult, perhaps, um, or who maybe live in Africa where uh, there seems to be a lot more demonic activity. But actually, I think there is demonic activity in our culture too. It's just that I think the demons are clever and they like the fact that most people don't believe that they're there. And so they keep themselves quiet and they don't go in for dramatic, scary tactics like they might do in other cultures where people certainly do believe in, in un, unclean and demonic spirits and, and are terrified of them. The problem with Westerners is, is, is that we're complacent uh, and we don't think they exist. Uh, and the, de the demons are quite happy that we think that. Unless we think that Jesus was largely wasting his time uh, when he went around driving out spirits from his Jewish brothers and sisters, we should be willing to recognise the possibility that spiritual deliverance could be essential, an essential part to someone's full healing. So these were seven things which I didn't want to do. Um, but I did out of obedience. And I can honestly say that just as Naaman's skin was completely restored, I have not suffered a, f from depression at all for 14 years. My life is radically changed. Uh, I cope with stress, uh, and church leaders do uh, sometimes have to experience a fair amount of stress. Um, I have friends now who I stay in communication uh, with. My family life is, is uh, so much happier. And almost every day I consciously thank God for the healing that he has given me. Even the worst days now I experience are better than the ones I knew when I was oppressed by uh, anger and depression. Well, we've come to the end of our teaching series on mental well-being. Uh, we've looked at some difficult subjects, but I do pray that you've been encouraged that with God there is hope and healing uh, in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of his Spirit. Amen. Bless you. Um, I hope you found that helpful. Martin speaking about uh, the healing that he has um, received. Um, but uh, seven things uh, that he said he, he believes the Lord um, was leading him to in the same way that Naaman the Syrian had to dip seven times in the River Jordan uh, before uh, he knew healing. Uh, being willing to admit the full extent of the problem and its impact on others, Martin said. This is what Ma Martin was led to. Be willing to seek medical advice and accept medical treatment when it was offered. Uh, to be willing to receive counselling. Um, and then lifestyle and dietary. Well, it might be d different for you or for me than it was for Martin, but giving up caffeine, giving up alcohol. Um, I, I just didn't understand that, <laughs> Martin. I didn't understand it at all. No, anyway, there we go. Um, the discipline of going to bed and getting enough sleep. Maybe that might speak to you as well. But then lastly as well, receiving prayer ministry. Uh, for Martin, just taking the pill... Uh, wasn't enough. Anyway, um, we are we are starting a, a messy church service here in fifteen minutes. I want to allow us. I want to allow you time to share in fellowship to, to together. So um, we're just going to have one more song, uh, but a chance to pray together. So after the talk that we've heard, um, perhaps a, a chance for us to share or to pray together. Um, I've got three prayers to lead us in, uh, a prayer against depression, a prayer when we are in deep darkness, and a prayer for escaping the pit of depression. Uh, three prayers that uh, three different people have offered uh, that we might find helpful today. So let's just have a prayer. Let's, let's pray.
sickness and illness and injury do not just affect those who don't believe, Whilst we are responsible for our own troubles a lot of the time, we live in a broken world. John Barnett, a man named John Barnett, has offered this as a prayer against depression. Heavenly Father, please strengthen our hearts and remind us to encourage one another when the troubles of life start to overwhelm us. Please guard our hearts from depression. Please give us the strength to rise up each day and fight against the troubles which seek to weigh us down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And a lady called Beth Baus has offered this as a prayer when we are in deep darkness. O oh Lord, the darkness has taken hold of me. I can't find my way back to the light. I can see no way on and no way out. Sometimes ending it all seems like the best option. Yet there is something in me that wants your light to snuff out the darkness still. So I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would do just that. Shine your light on me. Shine your light in me. O oh Lord, when I feel alone, cause me to know you with me. When I feel invisible, cause me to know you see me. When I feel worthless, cause me to know you love me still. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And a prayer for escaping the pit of depression, um, written by a lady called Mary Sutherland. Lord, it seems as if my world has collapsed. I am in a deep, dark pit. I come to you in complete surrender. Carry me now, shield me now, protect me now, and keep me now. Please lift me up and show me the way. Take me by the hand. Lead me up, lead me out, and lead me on. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a, a closing song, and then I'd like to invite those on Zoom. Uh, please do, uh, please do, oh, what have I done now? Please, please do stay on Zoom uh, for our, um, for a, a five minutes fellowship. But our, our last song that we're going to have is a song called I Am Carried. Um, I think, um, I don't know if it was Barbara or Pam also picked Amazing Grace. Uh, we'll have to have that some other time. Uh, but we're going to have a song called I Am Carried, um, just, to, uh, just to finish.